Hey y'all, Kelly here. Welcome to the Ground Shots podcast, a podcast exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling. Coming at you from South Hill, Virginia, my hometown, where spring is finally underway (laughs) after a long, hard, icy winter. We spent half of it in Colorado and half of it here in Virginia, and I'm really excited to see red buds flowering and trout lilies up and flowering and blood roots and uh yeah and soon we're gonna be hitting the mountains and getting out of the Piedmont region where I grew up and doing some mountain explorations this summer for a little bit in Appalachia I'm really excited about that because I used to live in Appalachia many years ago and it's been quite a few years now since I've Uh, spent a spring there and really excited for that although it's it's definitely jarring I'm I'm going through a kind of emotional roller coaster of how different a humid climate is and the culture of the east (laughs) that I haven't really been around very much in a while the east coast of like the United States I know many of my listeners here are worldwide so when I say the east that's what I mean being someone who's moved around a lot the past eight years or so and spent a lot of time in different areas in concentrated amounts all over Turtle Island and really getting to witness spring and and all the seasons in different places. It's it's an interesting dance to feel this connection to many places at once and often the place where you are, you're, you're feeling all of these things, you're smelling certain smells and hearing certain sounds and the palpable feeling in the air is so specific to certain places that coming back here, there's a feeling in the air and a smell and a taste and all of it brings back a lot of different interesting memories, especially being right here in my hometown where growing up, um, I had to be inside in a school all day in the spring and I had really bad seasonal allergies, which I still do. So I'm waiting for that to hit really bad. I think it's starting right now, but, and, um, the feeling like I couldn't go outside and be safe. It's like, I wasn't encouraged to do that. I pretty much went to school and then got into trouble sometimes after school for a little bit (laughs) where there was really nothing to do. Like literally I tell Gabe, um, who's here with me right now, that like the only thing to do in my hometown was to hang out in the Walmart parking lot or the food line parking lot or behind the dumpsters. There really was nothing to do. I know now there are more places to go do things on the land, like go to the river or the lake that's here Uh, There are trails, there are shorelines, there are places to put in kayaks and canoes, but I wasn't encouraged to do that growing up. I wasn't told that I could, you know, growing up as a female assigned person in this small town in the South, I was told that it would be unsafe for me to do anything alone out on the land. And I think a lot over the years traveling around, I've been trying to challenge that especially a lot of time being by myself in remote places and really wanting to say, no, I want to be out here. Yeah, it's a little jarring and scary sometimes. And there are times where I maybe am not super safe. Um, But yeah, being here is bringing back that experience I had of sort of feeling like I had to be inside a lot during... (laughs) spring and then in the summer it's just so freaking hot where I grew up and um you either have to be by water or inside at least that's what I used to think there aren't a lot of places to hike and people just farm here and all the trees are cut down in a lot of places uh and it's just really scorchingly hot and if you're not out working on the land like farming growing tobacco or soybeans uh, 
you might be maybe riding your speedboat on the lake or something, but who has who has a speedboat here? Not not many people. It's not a canoe culture necessarily either. I just yeah, I didn't have access to those things and now I do and have a different perspective on what is possible. But I I still feel some some weird uncomfortable feelings around spring here because of that. And in the mountains where we're going to be going soon, I have felt um, a different experience because I used to live kind of in a semi-off-grid community, farming, foraging kind of of situation, really close to National Forest, and yeah, with a community of people who did other kinds of things on the land, like canoeing, fishing, um, hiking, medicine-making, you know, uh, growing as much food as possible and celebrating the seasonal cycles of the land together. And we're going to be back in that community for a little bit. And, and that's definitely a community where I have lots of close friends and memories of good times and, and really, uh, yeah, memories of a time where I kind of could reinvent and reevaluate what the seasons felt like to me. I mean, there's been many experiences I've had in my life living in different places where I've had that. But again, too, it does feel slightly uncomfortable. I'm just kind of like being real right now. Like, (laughs) it's been a hard winter and deciding to stick around for a little while longer here after so much time in the West where there's just this expansiveness. I mean, I know we talk about wilderness on this podcast and challenging the idea of what that is. And I know even in myself, the internal conflict I have, the feeling I have in a place where there's not much public land, it really is palpable. It feels oppressive. It feels like um, the constructs and fence lines and the borders of private land ownership really confines what people can do with their bodies on the land and it's hard for me to fully articulate that without like saying things like there's no wilderness here or something because obviously we know that wilderness as a concept of like a place that's unpeopled is problematic so I'm just grappling with all of that right now experiencing the east and feeling very um, confined and closed in and controlled. I know that partly is the culture I grew up in and like the people I grew up around and the experience I had here and still feel like kind of shadow uh, um, <laughs> comes into my life still just being here. You know, you anyone who goes back to where they grew up often feels like they are 15 years old again. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's... At the same time, I'm really just trying to see it in a new light, you know, see the place in a new lens based on all the experiences I've had and and really getting perspective on places I love out west uh, and what I feel like I got open to in the west that I can't undo at this point. And anyways... I don't want to get too much into my own process right now because it's not really exactly what I'm here to do. I know I do that a little bit on the podcast from time to time, but um, maybe as the season unfolds, I'll be able to have more specific words to describe all of this inside of me in a different way. But, um, But right now, I'm going to introduce this podcast episode, which again, I am not hosting. I'm just introducing here right now. And it's super exciting again to pass off the podcast occasionally for other folks to host and uh, do interviews. It's kind of fun to do that and then be the one that kind of goes back through and organizes it and um, puts it out into the world and reflects on, on it. So Gabe Crawford, who's been on the podcast several times at this point. Uh, One episode with Nikki Hill on rethinking invasive plants and the wild tending episode a lot of people really enjoyed. And he and I did the Colorado Trail last summer and we did a bunch of episodes where we kind of journaled about what we were experiencing through the podcast. And we also did an episode recently on anthropogenic landscapes. And then the last episode that was put out was 
Gabe re catching up with Dan and Amkin of the Young Warrior Society. I really hope y'all enjoyed that episode, and I really did enjoy listening to it myself, too. And this podcast episode is Gabe interviewing Angela Moles, who is a professor in Australia. So if you've been listening to the Ground Shots podcast for a while now, you know that we've definitely been doing some episodes in the past year on ecology and ecological history, botany, anthropogenic landscapes, invasion biology, and just really looking at a lot of those things and how they're intertwined and how colonization is a part of that as well. So this episode was inspired by Gabe's research this past fall when we were in our bell tent in Colorado. He really kind of focused a lot of time on diving into especially the academic research on invasion biology and sort of ecological history that's out there. And through his research, you know, to also trying to understand better the human relationship with land historically and how a lot of that is left out of mainstream academic literature that's obviously very European centric, very white, you know, a lot of older white men, academic folks writing um, and doing the research and and really dictating what then is thought or said or accepted as truth from then on. So a lot of looking at the history is really trying to understand what we think about the natural world today and science and um, and human relationship with the land and, and how that former research or former uh, those former writings and and people's thought processes at that time how that influences today and maybe some of those things need to be reevaluated and we haven't and many people could agree that some of the things that were said 100 200 years ago need to be reevaluated but no one's taking the time to do that maybe or or taking the time to look five steps backwards into that and um a lot of things are just accepted as truth that need to kind of be seen a little differently. And so through Gabe's research this fall, he discovered the work of several scientists that he really appreciated and some indigenous uh, writers and authors and uh, land tenders as well. And um, But Angela Moles is someone that Gabe discovered who has written some really amazing pieces on plants and done some really incredible research really incredible quantifiable uh, large-scale research on plant evolution and Gabe decided to reach out to her to see if she would be on the podcast and she said yes so this is a conversation with Gabe and Angela Moles and Angela Moles is the director of the Evolution and Ecology Research Center at UNSW Sydney in Australia Her research aims to improve understanding of plant responses to climate change and to quantify the ways introduced species change when they are introduced to new ranges. Angela is also a mother and a surf lifesaver. So a lot of Angela's research is really (laughs) changing the culture of science right now. And in some ways, a lot of people are resistant to it and other folks are really seeing the validity of some of the work that she's putting out there and and coming around but in this conversation with with Angela Gabe and Angela get really into the culture of science and how it's a pretty hard thing to to make big paradigm shifts with that's one of the biggest things that they speak about and they also speak about Angela's specific research with the global herbivory project and and more of her research in evolutionary biology and ecology it's definitely a really awesome conversation and it feels like such a treat to have Angela as a guest on the podcast so really am excited to share this with y'all and uh, there will be a conversation aired in May as well uh, around the same topic talking about invasive plants and ecological history and and evolution of biology with Matthew Chu, who we've also mentioned on the podcast as well. Previously, we, we, I think we cited in the show notes for the episode, a couple episodes back where Gabe and I focused on anthropogenic landscapes. We, we did cite Angela Moles 
and Matthew Chu's articles in the show notes. So now we're going to interview them and you can listen to what they have to say to, f- to better understand for yourself what you want to believe and think and understand about uh, invasion biology and conservation and um, ethnobotany as a field. You know, we're here exploring these ideas and I'm, I'm very malleable and really wanting to kind of see the bigger picture myself as well, you know, and I think as a philosopher as well, I'm always trying to challenge <laughs> or or see a context for why we think about certain things and really look at language. So this is going to be, you know, a part of the Wild Tending series in a way. It's a part of the series we've been doing on kind of picking apart invasion biology a little bit and sort of really diving into that. And so, yeah, this episode and then another one we're going to air in May with Matthew Chu is also going to be on Calibri Terra Sun and Blooms of podcast voices for nature and peace is Calibri's podcast so yeah we'll, we'll both be airing that uh interview which was done with gabe nikki hill and Calibri and matthew chu i'm really really excited about that one as well so if you enjoy this episode you will also really appreciate the perspectives that that episode is going to be bringing to this conversation so let's go ahead and get to this combo. I'm, I'm going to hand it off now to Gabe and uh, I hope y'all really enjoy listening. Take care. Thank you so much for joining me. No worries. Thank you. It's so crazy that we can talk from opposite sides of the globe like this, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful? Well, um, it's so good to have you here. I've been so excited <laughs> about this and um, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Angela. Yeah, I'm Professor Angela Moles. I'm the director of the Evolution and Ecology Research Center at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Awesome. And from what I've uh, read up and watched on YouTube, it seems like you've done a pretty good job of stirring up the pot in a good way in like the ecological community on a global level and to give our uh, listeners some context could you talk a little bit about some of your projects like the uh, global herbivory project and uh, things like that yeah so I started out my career being interested in the different ways that plants grow and reproduce in different parts of the world so in the world herbivory project or herbivory um I actually went and visited 75 different ecosystems around the world and measured how much the plants were getting eaten by animals like mammals and insects and things. Um, And so I had sites everywhere from sort of uh, Eastern Greenland to the Congo to Southern Argentina, Australia, you know, everywhere, deserts, rainforests, savannas. It was really, really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, So what I did... Uh, After that, sort of funding in Australia has become impossible to get if you just want to understand the way the world works. You now actively have to be doing something related to conservation or saving it, something that's directly useful. Um, And so I sort of, I took that interest in the way that the environment shapes species and I started looking at introduced species and I thought, well, this is kind of cool because what you've got is these plants and animals that have been introduced to a place from somewhere else where it's different. They get here, they're interacting with different species, the climate's different, like, you know, everything's totally different. What I thought was, well, we might actually see evidence of these species starting to evolve in response to those differences and environment. We had a few examples of that happening. So there was a famous case study in Australia. So here they brought in cane toads to control some um, beetles on the sugar crops. Right, right terrible invader right across the entire north of the country. But the scientists have shown that the cane toads here were evolving and they were getting like longer legs and they would hop in a straighter direction. And so it was helping them to spread out more quickly across the country. Wow. And that was kind of cool. They introduced a concept called the Olympic village effect, where basically only the fastest, the super athlete cane toads would be at the outside edge of the range. And so those athletes would breed with each other and make baby toads that were even better athletes. Um, wow. So, so this, this is your rapid at what you discussed when uh, and rapid evolution and how it is, it is happening all over the globe with the uh, yeah. introduced species. 
Yeah, so if you go back, you know, to Darwin's time, he, he was basically reading about geology and he thought that evolution happened on sort of evolutionary, on geological timescales as well, that it took thousands right. and thousands of years and lots of generations. But it's been becoming clearer and clearer over the last couple of decades that plants and animals can actually change very, very fast yeah. when there's a strong selective pressure. So, for instance, with Darwin's finches, those famous finches on the Galapagos Islands that he yeah. used to sort of, you know, consolidate his thinking about evolution, there was a study on them more recently by the Grants, and they they've uh, studied the birds through a drought, and basically it didn't rain for a while in the Galapagos, and the soft uh, the plants that make the soft little seeds died out and all there was to eat were these seeds that were in really hard cases and so only the birds that were big enough and tough enough to be able to split open those cases were able to actually survive and so just over one year there was a massive change in the size of the birds that were alive there so wow. you can have these events and they can sweep through a population and cause a real you know lasting change wow that's fascinating and that was fairly recent so that's probably related to some sort of climate change with that drought coming through the Galapagos right because that's a big topic with the uh, invasive and introduced species is like in the context of climate change um, but to give people a little background I love the way you talk about acclimatization societies which is in Darwin's age right and just like it helps give us some context and I love your positive attitude about how it uh sets us up today for this amazing experiment to participate in to observe evolutionary ecology on a global scale. So I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so basically, if you go back 100 or 150 years, people's attitudes to introduce species were completely and utterly different. Um, so the European people who are, you know, spreading around the world, coming into, you know, places like America and Australia and New Zealand, um, they often set up these things called acclimatization societies. And what the acclimatization societies did was to enrich the native flora and fauna of the places that they got to. So they tried really hard to introduce new species, partly because they wanted them for hunting or to remind them of home, or right. you know, just because they missed those species. So one of the most fun examples is from the States, the acclimatization society that was in New York Someone in that thought they were really clever because they'd read the entire works of William Shakespeare. Yeah. And they decided to introduce every bird species that Shakespeare mentioned to Central oh, wow. Park. Wow. And some of those, you know, just went extinct pretty much instantly. Um, quite a few of them are still there. And one of the examples of these is the starling. That's right. how the starling got in. And the starling has become a major invader. It's a massive pest to grain crops and things worldwide. It causes billions of dollars worth of damage. And you right. get these just mega clouds of birds that make the sky go black. Yeah. Yeah, they make a lot of ruckus. I love listening to starlings. They're like one of my favorite birds to listen to. <laughs> Yeah, with the context of these acclimatization societies today, we're getting to participate in this kind of experiment and how, but how we observe this experiment seems to be a big object of debate. And it, and I'm yes. curious, what was your uh, process like in having an attitude change about how you see these introduced plants? Yeah, so despite my broken mix of everywhere af accent, I, uh, I grew up in New Zealand and New okay. Zealand is sort of second to Hawaii as, you know, one of the most seriously invaded places in the world. Um, so in New Zealand, as a young conservation student, you're taught about how all these terrible invaders came in and, you know, destroyed everything. Um, and then I went on a trip um, and I went to a visit ecologists in different parts of the world yeah and I met the ecologists in England and they were talking about all the diversity that was in gardens and they were talking about how they brought in this species and now it was starting to spread over the hills and it was enriching their flora and I was like oh my goodness you people are doing so much damage and you don't understand yeah. and then I went to Sweden and I was told how the government was actually paying people to put cows on the land, even though dairy farming wasn't particularly uh, lucrative in that climate, the government had to pay to keep the cows on the land because they kept disturbing it 
and allowed the little herbaceous vegetation to um, survive because otherwise wow. it just goes into being a conifer forest with you know not right. very many species. So they're they're keeping that seral stage of succession at an earlier stage to increase the the plant exactly because all of the diversity in those ecosystems is the little herbaceous things, right? Wow. Those beautiful little things they get in the fields. That's so cool! I didn't know that. Um, and it just it just blew my little kiwi brain up. I was like, oh my <laughs> goodness! And it took me a really long time to accept it myself. But yeah. now, now I'm looking at all of the evidence, and it's coming in from all around the world about species adapting to their new environments. I'm also looking at lots of evidence about how species are responding to climate change, which is one of my current research interests. So yeah. I'm looking at how the native species are evolving uh, right. and how they've changed already over the past two or three decades in response to the climate change that's already happened. Um, right. And what I'm thinking is we've got this conservation ethos, which is that we have to hold the, the ecosystems in the condition they were when the Europeans colonized. That's what most right. countries have sort of chosen. So here in Australia, it is 1788 was the year in which Australian ecosystems were perfect. And we're gonna try and hold them at that. And right. restoration tries to put them back to that and conservation tries to hold them there. And the thing is, if you look over a longer time frame, um, and this is really clear in North America where the ice sheets are wandering around over the continent, right. the ecosystems don't just stay in place. Yeah. Things move, things evolve, things go extinct, things speciate, yeah. all sorts of stuff happens. And trying to sort of hold it still is like standing at the beach trying to stop the tide. Yeah. And so right, what, right. I'm, what I'm trying to say to people is that, because I, I desperately love our native ecosystems and yeah. I want them to have a, as good a chance as possible into the future. But I think trying to hold them how they were in the past is actually just going to be a losing strategy. I think we can do better if instead of going, we've got to kill the invaders, which is such an appealing thing to many people's psyches. We, we really, yeah. as humans, we do the them and us, and this is evil and bad and it doesn't belong here, right. and I'm going to kill it, and then I'll feel good about myself. But yeah. if instead we go, what would we like to have here in 100 years' time and manage for that rather than trying to hold that tide back? Wow. That's so cool, man. Ah, that's, that's why I, I really, really got into your research. And one of the coolest, one, my favorite paper is your academic paper called Invasions, the Trail Behind, the Path Ahead, and the Test of a Disturbing Idea. And what I appreciate is that you are mentioning the dogmatic aspects of the ethos of conservation biology and invasion ecology. But you're also doing a really good job at holding many contradicting viewpoints at the same time and just laying out what you're observing and the data you're collecting. And um, I know I, I definitely I'm going to put this uh, in the show notes for the people to read this, but could you explain this project and, and um, in Australia, what you're kind of doing with this right now and just like the tests you're doing with uh, the changes that you're seeing? Yeah, so. I think, first off, to, to dogma, like, it's really difficult. I think people often overestimate how much scientists understand about the world, and particularly with ecology. Yeah. Ecosystems are incredibly difficult, complex things that are affected by, you know, the temperature and the rainfall and the microbes in the soil that nobody ever thinks about and the herbivores and the plants and the animals, you know. Right. It's just everything is going on interacting together and we simply don't have a great understanding of what happens if you say increase the temperature a little bit so right. i think people are looking to the scientists in the face of climate change and thinking that we're going to be able to step in and save things and, and we don't necessarily know enough about how it all works to really make great predictions we're doing our best but it's really really difficult um and the thing with uh dogma is that scientific thought, I mean, you've got to remember that all scientists are humans and yeah. all humans, we have our ideas. And once we see some evidence for that idea, we sort of, we seek out more evidence that supports our own viewpoint. And we do this in all of the aspects of our lives. Right. Yeah. And so changing the direction of thinking in science is like trying to turn around a big ocean liner. It yeah. happens very, very gradually at the start and then sort of, once you get a little bit of momentum on the change, then you can have sort of a paradigm shift, but it's very, very difficult. 
Um, and yeah. it's very difficult for a scientist to sort of change the way everybody else is thinking. And of course, the entire of conservation is about holding things how they were at this one right. static point. Um, so yeah. that was fun. The, the paper about disturbance that you were talking about, that was uh, fo putting the focus not so much on the invading species themselves, but on what we have done to the ecosystems. So here in Australia, for instance, uh, in Sydney, we have really low nutrient soil. Like it's not brown stuff that you might expect. It's basically just sand in yeah. big parts of the place. And our native species are adapted to that. And in fact, if you go out and you fertilize a banksia, it dies. Uh, wow. Whereas if you fertilize the weeds, they're like, woohoo, and they, they grow right. better. Yeah. Um, and so one of the real problems we have is urban runoff. So things like dog poos and all the stuff wow. that comes from, from urban places trickling down into our native ecosystems. And of course, it kills back or disadvantages the native species and the invaders absolutely love it. You combine that with some fire suppression and you've got a really invaded ecosystem. And still we look at that and we go, oh, those terrible invaders. And we never look at what has changed. And if you think about it, your ecosystem is full of species that have been evolving in that landscape for like thousands of generations probably. Um, yeah. So they're actually pretty good at living there. If you introduce something from England or somewhere, it shouldn't actually have much of a chance of out competing the thing, the local species that are adapted for those conditions. Right. And what I, what I was getting at in that paper is that the times you get the invasive species coming in are really when we've changed the disturbance regime. And it's not necessarily about just disturbing it, um, so, for instance, I'm, I'm sure you noticed that Australia caught fire about a year ago. Yeah, um, right. And an awful lot of our coast burned. Now, yeah. the ecosystems around here, they're not supposed to burn that intensely uh, and that much. Uh, but around Sydney, they burn on average every 12 and a half years. And if you actually stop the fires, then you get more introduced species coming in. So you need yeah. what you need to keep your ecosystems healthy is to keep them in about the same disturbance regime that the species evolved with. Yeah, and Australia is a very, parts of Australia at least, were very uh, fire frequent ecologies because of the indigenous people. They were basically, they were always burning and maintaining e ecosystems. And when they got with the with the colonial genocide that happened in Australia, getting pushed onto reservations, it, that, that initiated a massive change in the overall like uh, mosaic of ecosystems in Australia. And um, yeah. I like how you taught your example of the dingo too. Could you could you uh, give our listeners yes. some of that context too? Because yes. that's such a good way to frame this. Yeah, uh, so this was, I, I should go back a little bit, is that some of my research has shown that introduced species, some of them, and in particular, this one daisy that was introduced to Australia from South Africa, yeah. It's changed so much since it got here that we reckon it's a new species now. It, um, wow. it looks different. Its flowers are different. It flowers at a different time. When you force it to cross with its original population, the offspring are like much, much worse at surviving than the purebred offspring. Wow. Like it's, it's acting like a biologically uh, isolated species. Um, so in the context of that, I was sort of saying, well, you know, not only are our ecosystems and species moving around and doing things at different times under climate change, we've got these introduced species that have come in. And rather than having sort of the same daisy all over the world, what we're actually getting is this weird adaptive radiation where you've got now different species, uh, different forms of that same species um, emerging in all of the different places it got introduced to. Yeah. And what I was thinking of with the dingoes was thinking, you know, people come in here. So, for instance, I, uh, my partner and I both moved to Australia like about sort of 20 years ago now. Our children are considered Australians because they were born here. But you look at something like, say, a clover plant, which came in about 130 years ago, and everyone yeah. like, it's introduced, it doesn't belong here. The dingo is an interesting one because the indigenous people brought the dingo in about four and a half thousand years ago. And it is now 
it's a very interesting species. The farmers hate it because it can attack sheep and things. And it also, do, it hybridizes with domestic dogs, which is a mm. real conservation problem. Um, but the purebred dingo, we do try and conserve them and we consider them a native species. And that is one of the things that our national parks organization tries to do is to protect them. So I'm like, well, how long does a thing have to be here for before we are going to consider it to be yeah. a native species? And what I think, going back to the acclimatization societies, we've got this very anti-introduced species mindset at the moment. And, yeah. and that is very justified. They do enormous amounts of damage, right? Um, but our mindset can change. Like if you go back to how things were looked at 150 years ago, it was completely different to now. And I wonder if into the future, we're going to be thinking about these introduced species a little bit differently thinking about some of the underlying causes of the, um, of the invasions that we're seeing. Um, so often it's because we've changed things about the disturbance regime in that ecosystem. Thinking about you know, the fact that some of these invaders have now actually sort of become local species themselves. So, that, so my daisy doesn't doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Right. And it seems like that can be a taboo subject, even though it has a lot of merit to it in conservation biology and invasion ecology. What have you been coming up with these uh, with these tests that you've been doing? Because it's not like this is just an idea. This is like an observable phenomenon happening. Yeah, yeah, it, it very much is. So we used uh, herbarium specimens. So these little pressed plants that are on pieces yeah. of paper. Um, and we looked at a whole bunch of species, like 23 different species, and something like 70% of those 23 species that have been introduced to Australia about 100 years ago had undergone changes uh, in their way they looked um, over that 100 years. We then used uh, genetics. We found one of the species that had been changing and we figured out exactly where in South Africa it came from. We know which beach the population oh, wow. that got introduced to Australia yeah. came from. So we've taken out all that sort of uncertainty and variation about, well, we don't know exactly which population. Um, so we, we did that. And then we grew the South African ones and the Australian ones in a glasshouse side by side. Um, and we grew them through one generation because sometimes the place the seeds grew can affect the way the offspring come up. Right. And so we grew them through one generation in the same conditions. And then we compared the traits of the South African ones and the Australian ones. And they are so, so different. They're just different wow. in every. You can look at them, you know which one you're looking at. Um, so the Australian one has uh, leaves a shape. The juvenile leaves are the shape of little teaspoons, um, while the South African ones, the leaves are the shape of sort of the, the lobe oak leaves that you get. Um, so yeah. they're wildly different. The, the stems are different. The South African ones grow a nice sort of robust upright shape while the Australian ones sprawl along the ground. Wow. And we think we know why, because we measured the wind speed in their home beach versus the beaches they grow in here, and it's windier here. So basically yeah. growing to keep their leaves above the sand, because they grow right. on sand dunes. Uh, we looked at their flowers. Like here, they barely get visited by pollinators, but at home they get pollinated plenty. Um, and the ones here, they don't bother making big, big showy flowers, because they're not going to get visited by anything anyway. And instead, they can actually just uh, fertilize themselves. The ones from South Africa, they make great big flowers <coughs> and they can't, they can't self-fertilize. So they wow. have to have an insect come. And so there's all these changes. And like I said before, when you do put them back together and you try and make them cross, you realize that the South African ones don't start flowering until six weeks after the Australian ones did. So even wow. if they were growing side by side, they wouldn't actually swap pollen, right? So they wow. wouldn't interbreed. But when you force them to do it anyway, then the offspring have like a 30% less survival chance. Like the seeds just don't go as well. Wow. Um, so basically it's on its way. Uh, I think it already is a new species and we're writing that up at the moment. Um, wow. But it's, it's at least on its way to becoming a new species. And if you look at how successful we've been at completely eradicating species, like once they've got established at a continent sort of a level, you can't really eradicate them very, yeah. very easily. It's almost never happened. Um, yeah. And so these things, they're here. We've seen from past work that things keep on evolving, like, you know, more than 100 years after they've been introduced, they're still changing. 
Yeah. Um, and so whether you believe that this one is already speciated or not, there's no chance we're going to get rid of it. It's going to carry on. It will continue to get more and more different from its uh, ancestral population from South Africa. Eventually, it's going to be a new species. And wow. we've got we've got 3,000 introduced species in this country. It won't be, you know, the one we've studied is not the only one that this is happening to. That's right. And so we've got this interesting case where all of these introduced species have dropped into this whole new world down here and they're changing in response to that. So sooner or later, if you came back to Australia in 2000 years time, a lot of those introduced species will see, still be there. Um, and just incidentally, I would love to click my fingers and remove a whole bunch of these. That would be great. Um, but it's not going to happen, you know, with the best will in the world and with you know, much more GDP allocated to controlling introduced species than is ever going to happen. We still couldn't do it. Yeah. So they're going to be here and they're going to keep changing. And that's like, I, I don't want to sound like I'm cheering for the weeds here. I'm just sort of saying, look, this is what the evidence is. This is happening. They've yeah. come in here, they're changing, they're going to keep changing. And sooner or later, they're going to be so different to what they were when they started that they will count as new species. And at that point, what do you do? Do you still want to eradicate them? And I love asking yeah. ecological audiences this because they, Such a good they question. start out like with their arms folded and looking really cross at me. And by the end, <laughs> they're usually looking a bit confused and go, oh my goodness, this is... <laughs> You're calling out the elephant in the room, Angela. It's uh, <laughs> bringing it all the way back around. They are on their way to becoming unique native endemic Australian species and native endemic species are what people native plant theorists love that's what they're in the whole thing for so it kind of really does call out the elephant in the room and it is an uncomfortable conversation but it is a very necessary one so and with this you know it seems like also hybridization is also a taboo like hybridization and adaptation is a taboo subject in conservation biology and invasion ecology in the context that you're talking about because it does call out the elephant in the room you just discussed of like no well there's some bigger things happening that we are ignoring and you've even said uh in in your article that we're discussing about like what questions is invasion ecology looking over like what are the big important questions that we're looking over here that could drastically change our approach and our relationship here yeah yeah it's um it is, it's a very difficult thing. And I mean, remember that I'm, I'm usually presenting this to a room full of people who are passionate about eradicating introduced species and returning yeah. their precious, you know, native ecosystems um, to the condition, to their pristine condition. And it's just so difficult. And it's, I, I want the best for those, those native ecosystems. So this afternoon I have, I have a, a local government meeting. So a, a state government, um, and I'm going to be presenting about the impacts of climate change on our ecosystems because I, yeah. I realized that some of the people in charge of this thought that under climate change, the ecosystems were all just going to sort of, you know, move towards the poles or move uphill or whatever, and they'd all sort of just move together and things would stay sort of the same. Right. Um, but when you look at the evidence about how species are adapting to climate change, so one, there's lots of species that are undergoing adaptive change already in response to the changed conditions. Uh, there are lots of species that are flowering or putting out their leaves or whatever at different times. And there are lots of species that are moving, but they're not all doing it at the same rate. So some yeah. of them are staying still. Some of the species are moving in the wrong direction. Um, yeah. So you've got species right. and it's, it's like 10, 15% of the species, instead of moving towards the colder climates, they go in the opposite direction and we don't wow. know. We don't know how to predict who's going to do that or why they're doing that or what it all means. And so what we're faced with is trying to predict these ecosystems under conditions where they're changing and reassembling really, really fast. And I think looking at North America and what happened after the big ice sheet retreated yeah. is actually really informative there because you guys have got loads of pollen cores. Australia is too dry to have much in the way of good swamps accumulating pollen, but you guys have got right. loads of um, right. And then what you can see is you can see the ecosystem shifting around really fast, but you can also see that if you go back, not very far at all, just a couple of thousand years, really, you can get to conditions where there is nothing like that today. And in those conditions, 
where there's nothing like it today. They call it no modern analog conditions. You get community types that we just don't see today. Mm -hmm. And so as we project that forwards and we go, well, what are we going to have in these parts of the world in 50 years time or 100 years time as the climate change accelerates, we're going to get to conditions that, that we simply don't have at the moment. And that probably means we're going to have community types that we've never seen. And that's without even considering, you know, all of the changes in disturbance that we're throwing in. Right. Uh, things like throwing salt on the roads is an interesting thing for invasions. Right. Um, yeah, because it's a change. It's a um, like it's a change. It's, it's as simple big, as that. You change yeah. how it was. Yeah. Because that runoff can create pH changes in soil, which I mean, uh, well, could bring a whole new community of plants that like that different kind of pH. Do you? What do you think about the pressures that um, humans put on plants and their and our obsession for eradication is? How do you think that's influencing like the bigger picture of of plant evolution? Like, you know, the super weeds that that are they're genetically adapting themselves to handle massive amounts of glyphosate or in the United States, coyotes. It seems like every coyote that we kill in the United States uh, turns into five more coyotes. <laughs> and they're, they're responding to, to that stress by just making more pups when they do breed. And so what do you think about our pressures on these plants and how that's going to affect the bigger picture evolutionary dynamics there? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, humans make an enormous amount of difference to the ecosystems and to the species. Um, yeah. we, are, we are certainly capable of exerting really major selective forces uh, on these species. But a lot of it is is kind of accidental. It's things like having, you know, having things evolve, you know, glyphosate uh, resistance and things like that. And I think the moral of the story is that where there is a selective pressure, organisms are able to change. And there's lots of evidence from birds and insects and plants and things. And this is from all across the world. Things can change. Things can, things can change within just a few generations. So yeah. within 10 years, you can see real evolutionary change. It's not like right. you know waiting for geology to happen. You don't have to come back in a thousand years time. If yeah. there's a selective pressure, things will change. And we are putting on so many selective pressures now. We're yeah. changing so many things about the natural environment out there. And it's just, it's just happening on every front. I mean, nighttime light affecting the insect populations or the right. pesticides that we use in, you know, affecting insects as well. The climate change affecting just about everything. The introduced species themselves come in and cause selective pressures on the native species. And everything's just constantly adapting and changing. Um, yeah. And it's very, very difficult to tell how that's going to pan out because there's such complicated systems yeah it seems like our obsession with trying to predict the exact way it will come out is kind of it, it, it we're running a, like a dog chasing our own tail huh? <laughs> yeah the models the the people who do ecological modeling are making these wildly complicated models and they run all these permutations and they put in a probability of this and a probability of that and they account right. for evolution and they account for this and that but it's still, it's such a complicated process. Like, yeah. like we, we ecologists do have physics envy where you can boil everything down to a nice neat equation or you know, just, just calm right. everything down to what's happening inside one tiny chamber and look at your atoms. Um, it's right. just such a messy and unpredictable system out there. Because you, uh, you also talk about how the um, individual studies make seemingly clear results, but the larger picture is still completely idiosyncratic synchronistic and inconsistent, right? So could you talk about that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, I can. So basically there's been loads and loads of effort in ecology trying to like, you know, predict the traits of the best invaders and things. Can we figure out who they are and maybe kill them before they get established and things like that? Um, and the thing is, so there's loads and loads of studies, but they're all done on different ecosystems in different parts of the world. And you get a really clear result from this one ecosystem here and you find that the small, fast growing ones with little seeds, you know, that make lots of little seeds are, right. are invading the best. And then you look at that and then you look in and that might be done sort of at a roadside that's being mown frequently or something. And then you look at what's invading into a rainforest and it might be completely different, might be completely opposite types of traits. Yeah. 
Um, and I think the, the trouble is we've got to consider not just the traits of the species that are coming in, but also the conditions in the ecosystems that they're invading and the other native species that they're going to be coexisting with, because all of that together acts to shape what is most successful there. Yeah. So it's just really, really complicated. And just by looking at the invasive species and going, it was them, they did it. Um, it doesn't quite work. We have to look at the climate and the other, all of those interactions with other organisms. And it, it seems like there's a, a dysfunctional amount of generalizations and sampling biases taking and confirmation bias and reference bias in the papers that get the circle jerk of the peer review process. It seems like, like you said, and I appreciate hearing this from you, just like how scientists are people with ideas and that there's dogma and that just lay people have a tendency to put scientists on this pedestal and just like take it just because it's been through a peer review process. Like it is the word of God. But just remembering that we're all trying to figure this out. It is incredibly difficult to publish a piece of science, and particularly yeah. if it goes against the prevailing dogma. And right. peer review makes it so much better. Like it makes science right. strong. And yeah. it allows you to have this, this difference between things that have been nicely, neatly tested and, you know, things that are just someone's brain bubble. Right. Um, totally. So it is really, really important. But you're right. I mean, we're humans. Um, yeah. And it is difficult for us to change our ideas. There's definitely evidence that we cite the papers that say the things we agree with. Um, so, for instance, right. when I did that study of uh, how much plants get eaten all around different places in the world, I was really surprised. Like, everybody knew that in the tropics, plants got eaten more. But they don't. Um, it basically, if right. anything, it's slightly the other way. Um, wow. The plants up in the Arctic are really well defended against herbivores because if you grow in a place where it's only like sunny for six weeks of the year, you don't want to lose a leaf. Anyway, like uh, when I looked into that, I found just massive evidence for citation bias. And it was really, really difficult to get people right. to sort of engage with the fact that the first actual test of that at a big global scale had not supported their ideas. I I faced a lot of pressure under peer review. And I, I would tell you one story is um, I went to the, you know, one of those talks at the end of someone's career where they reflect on all of the major things they did. This person had just won a, a genetic society sort of gold medal or something. Okay. Um, and this was one of my collaborators and I forget how old he was. He's, he's, he's in the order of, I don't know, 85 or something. Uh -huh. um, and he is awesome. And, and he, was, he was talking about these three paradigm shifts that he'd created during his career. And I, I was sitting there and I was like, man, I'm trying to get a paradigm shift through. How do I do that? And I put up my hand at the end and I said, look, are, are geneticists just better at looking at the data and sort of actually changing their minds? And he just fixed me with this stare and said, no, uh, to change people's minds, all you have to do is outlive them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> He's like, he, just, he just outlived his opposition. Yeah. Yeah, because like with time in the context of introduced species, especially because invasion ecology is a very young field, right? Like 1958 is when Charles Elton wrote his book and then it didn't catch up until the 80s. And then since then, like you even talked about how the, the, the field of invasion ecology has just exploded in a relatively short period of time. And the amount of data that we've been able to collect as a reference point to make comparisons to has also been in a very short period of time. So what do you think about that? Just like the time scale, because that seems to be what you're really pointing to here is like you're a global ecologist, right? You're really trying to look at this on a global scale and what's happening in the big picture, because that's where you're seeing like the little stuff, the little tests make sense, but they can't be generalized over the big picture, just like how, you know, some invasive plants have caused a couple extinctions on Hawaii, for example, but people see it very common as people have, take, have taken that and made it a generalization and just say it everywhere and anywhere when there's really no, you've even said that there's no evidence to actually support that. So like, yeah, let's yeah, talk yeah. about this a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so invasive species are generally accepted as the second biggest threat to biodiversity worldwide. So the, the biggest threat is bulldozing. It turns out that that's pretty effective in uh, killing native right. species. 
course. There is no doubt that loads of introduced species have caused extinctions. So places like Hawaii and New Zealand, one thing they share is that they didn't have a, much in the way of native land mammals. So New Zealand, right. there were just some, some seals on the beaches and three species of bats. And I think two of those couldn't uh, fly. They just walked around on their elbows. They're kind of oh, wow. weird. Um, so yeah. when, <laughs> so New Zealand's cool. <laughs> New Zealand is cool. Yeah. Uh, so when native species, uh, when mammals were introduced to New Zealand, there were all these flightless birds that were really naive, you know, and the, the predators that were introduced, you know, cats and mustelids and things, they just absolutely mowed through the populations. So there's, there's sad stories like, you know, some, you know, desperately endangered species and they caught the last, you know, eight birds or something and they had them on a crate on the runway and they were going to fly them out to, you know, a safety of an offshore island where there weren't rats and other predators. Um, and the, the like lighthouse keeper's cat came along and the birds all stuck their heads out of the crate. Um, and that was the end of the species. Oh, wow. Um, like, wow. So there's all these there's all these examples and I'm, I'm not downplaying like the major changes that introduced species have, have caused. Um, but often when we look at the problems caused by introduced species, it's not very clear to me whether the problem is the invader itself or the changes to the ecosystem that have let the invader established. Uh, right. So is it in Sydney, the extra nutrients? Is it in Canada, the salt on the roadsides? Is it, you know, right. The changes in fire regimes is it the changes in grazing regimes um because usually that's what's let those yeah. uh, introduced species get in and so i think we pin all of the blame onto the invader and sort of sidestep the fact that we change the ecosystem and that's why they were able to get there in the first place but it's it's very yeah. difficult to sort of to pull apart like how much is the impact of adding that nutrient versus how much is the impact of the species that established because we added nutrients um you can't really do it very easily yeah we're kind of it's like the poor the plants are kind of the scapegoat for the 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 risk the chains that we're um we're Absolutely. helping to and, and we're we're you know we're a tribal primate we we love this them and us stuff and and yeah. uh I don't know about where you are in the world, but here it's a really big deal for people to go out and do bush regeneration and they go out and they pull yeah. out the weeds and, you know, they make yeah. their ecosystems nice and it can really make a huge difference to those little uh, parts of the world. But like the bigger problem is land clearing and we've got this, this massive problem of climate change uh, coming up and, you know, the yeah. impacts of that are becoming more and more noticeable. Absolutely. Um, so so with with to me, climate, it's not the invaders. It's it's yeah. what we are doing, the disturbances and those changes in the yeah. regime. Yeah, and the, the the disturbance suppression, especially too. Like in in the United States, we're having a big problem with fire suppression and a lot of endemic, uh, like pre-colonial systems that ecosystems that evolved in and co-evolved with humans, burning them. Like the where I'm at in Virginia right now, this was like uh, parts of like the coastal plain of Virginia was longleaf pine savanna that is a 100% fire dependent ecosystem that has been reduced to like 1% of its range it used to be cover the whole southeast southeastern united states there's some left in florida some left in georgia but humans literally kind of co-engineered this landscape through through constant fire cuz lightning fires don't really happen here in, in this part, like they happen every now and then in, in, in this part of the southeastern United States, at least they don't happen like constantly enough here uh, to the point that they could generate a whole unique ecosystem of longleaf pine savanna. And you see a lot of examples like that all over. We're going through that same thing here. And it's just like uh, I'm trying to um, I've been trying not to do the us and them thing with this, you know, because I have a lot of questions too, and I'm just trying to ask bigger questions, but then there's like people are so militant and charged about this thing, this particular subject that oftentimes I find when I just ask a question to kind of try to uh, get a bigger picture of it, I get accused of hating native plants and that I don't care about native plants, which I love native plants. And I just, I'm kind of trying to see the bigger picture beyond na secular nativism basically yes. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, I've I've been called a witch for my ideas, and yeah. um, it made me laugh. But <laughs> yeah, I'm thankful for the heretics. You know, the heretics, or you know, we we just questioning the paradigm. I think it's it. really important. Just yeah, because we don't always have things right, and yeah. particularly like the context of the speed with which invasion biology has become a discipline, and the speed with which it's clear the planet is evolving in response to climate change we've got to stay on our toes like we do. you can't just keep one static understanding as the world shifts around us we have to keep moving right. and if we think we had everything right in the 80s i yeah i i beg to differ and totally. i think uh one of the issues that we have made some progress on is understanding the role that our indigenous peoples had in shaping the ecosystems um yeah and Australia's about your perspective on that in Australia, because I've been really doing a lot of that research and, and trying to be a part of the advocacy and raising that awareness here. But um, Australia is one of the best examples of like a, a, a human co-engineered landscape, basically pre-colonization. What, what is Absolutely. your perspective Tens on that? Tens of thousands of years of co-evolution between the indigenous people and the vegetation. You can look through the charcoal cores and the pollen cores, and you can see these major swooping changes in the vegetation through time. Um, and you can also see all of our beautiful fire adapted species. Those little species that hold their seeds in these wooden uh, sort of pod things that split open when the um, fires come. You know, yeah. there's all of these things. And of course, when the European people colonized, they absolutely shut down the indigenous people and their burning. And yeah. uh, it is. It's a really interesting and difficult scenario now um, because we're, we're now in climate conditions that didn't ex exist within what the indigenous people were managing. And the, the extent of the massacres, the, the amount of knowledge and humanity that was lost when the European people came in. So we're asking, the indigenous populations now, we're sort of finally inviting them to the table, um, but they're managing a system that's really different to what they ever had. Um, and I suspect with quite a, a, a bit of a reduced pool of knowledge, although um, it is the case in Australia that uh, somebody like me is, is never going to know the full extent of the indigenous knowledge because the people have been uh, just, done over so many times by the European people sort of appropriating yeah. their knowledge and things. And so the position for most people in those communities now is, well, why would I share my knowledge with you? Yeah. You'll just you know, take it. Um, and so it's very, very difficult to sort of to figure out what the best uh, direction forward is, but yeah. absolutely including as much as possible. And, and one of the things I heard recently that I just didn't even know was that a lot of the burning was done by the women. And yeah. so even when the Europeans are finally asking the indigenous people to the table to start helping uh, manage this, um, those uh, they're asking the men. Right, right. Um, and Which so is what I appreciate. So much to understand. I, that's what I appreciate about you being like a woman in science, like being the one who's like really shifting a paradigm because like we do, live in this patriarchal world where like the role of women historically and currently is like overlooked and underappreciated and undervalued and underestimated and that is a really big problem that is a huge problem and it, it's like this what you're talking about with um you know you know reparations with uh, the indigenous peoples and like knowing that their, their compendium of traditional ecological knowledge is still very alive and intact, but they have every right and um, are very justified to not want to share it and keep it to themselves Absolutely. because of cult cultural I wouldn't appropriation. Share it with us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, We've been that, awful. <laughs> it's, that's a tricky thing that we're like, you know, that's, that's one of the big questions and the uncomfortable things we need to lean into nowadays with reparations is like, figuring out ways to make these reparations because making reparations with indigenous communities is making reparations with the land because you know it goes in line with restoring land sovereignty rights and land back and um but in the context of climate change yeah. the cool thing is like uh you know in australia especially they've been there for 
60,000 plus years. So they've witnessed climate change and have yes. a, 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 they have it in their stories and in their song lines, you know, they understand this, but it's just the problem with white supremacy and with colonization is that we've, you know, broken the trust so many times that it is, it, it, it's, it's, it's messed up. It's really bad. We're now in a, a terrible place where, yeah, I mean, if, so as I say, I come from New Zealand and in New Zealand, uh, the Maori population is so much just a part of the community. You have Maori friends, you know, a bunch of Maori words, you know, there's, this acknowledgement of the culture everywhere and it has gone to the place where it has it's overstepped now and we've got things like you know the New Zealand rugby team you know always does a Maori dance the haka before they oh, wow. you know, before yeah. they play and things and it's awesome and powerful but the Maori people are going you know what that's ours you can't yeah. have that as a national thing um, right. but from Australia we we can can only dream of that kind of integration um, because people were much more marginalized here. So we've, we've got further to go. Um, but yeah, uh, bringing that in. And I think relatively few ecologists are working with indigenous people enough. So that yeah. is one of the things that I'm trying to do as a director of this Ecology and Evolution Research Center is yeah. I've been appointed an ambassador for indigenous outreach and to try to just to just get it on people's radars a little bit that there's there's a whole population of people out here and they may have some pretty cool deep knowledge of the species and ecosystems that you're working with, you know, and even if, you know, even if you're just studying a lizard and you're like, oh, I don't see the relevance of this, you know, it might be someone's totem animal. They might, they might have this deep understanding and it would be just brilliant if we could start to respect that and work together. Um, yeah. But we have so, so far to go on that. Yeah, because, you know, the, the problem I've noticed with, uh, you know, traditional ecological knowledge in the context of Western science is that Western science always, there, there's this posturing from, you know, the, the scientists and Western scientists that, this, that they, they, they're trying to, you know, affirm, like, there's a competition. It seems like there's this competition that Western scientists create that they're like, well, if this isn't, quantifiable like but how do you quantify thousands and thousands of years of firsthand of observation tradition. passed down in, in in a in in oral storytelling tradition you know it's just as valid and just as real but it just is it's spoken in a different language and mental context and it's very spiritual which is western science is not a spiritual tradition right so it's it is a complicated it's very, very it's a whole different way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 mean, and I, just, I think, sorry, getting that di sorry, getting that diversity of thinking. I mean, we've shown over and over again, like with women in science or, or women in business, even, you know, that having those, that diversity of views is good. You make more progress if you have that diverse uh, range of ideas and so if you've got people who think completely differently rather than just going oh well that's silly or you know yeah but I do this um yeah. just to to try and and work with but I I don't know how to start on this because we've been we've been so damaging to these populations in the past that they don't want to share with us necessarily yeah and it, I don't blame them too it's it's no. It's, um I've, yeah in my own experience I've just had to be like open and humble and vulnerable with that and like let it happen organically and just be really culturally sensitive like the work I do particularly is with indigenous first food plants in the in in, in the western United States particularly just with uh, these culturally significant food plants that are being affected by climate change and I uh, I my main research is um basically studying the the disturbance in the land management practices that basically created these anthropogenic landscapes and how these uh, oftentimes considered rare endemic native plants are actually there because humans brought them there and planted them there and that they can be considered rare now because humans and grizzly bears, which were expert wildflower gardeners, aren't um, present in many areas basically harvesting and disturbing and planting back these foods i mean and 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 it's awesome that um this tradition is still very much alive in so many places throughout throughout the united states but like you said it's just kept silent you know and i, I i'm always like 
having to just like navigate being like extremely culturally sensitive and mindful of that. And sometimes I literally don't know what to do, you know, and I've been really blessed and humbled to have hung out with some really generous, you know, native folks, you know, who have, yeah, we've just, it's just it, developing those slow relationships and, and trust and it's, it's, it's good, but um yeah, I don't know. It's a big, that's, that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other thing that I'm not but, qualified to talk on. But, um, yeah, I, but I don't feel yeah. like I'm qualified to talk about it either. But I also like see that it is inseparable from ecology because he, we are a mammalian species that, that, you know, we modify our habitat like a beaver modifies its habitat. We are a part of ecology too. But in science, the prevailing uh, viewpoint is that humans are separate, you know, and the, you know, yeah. so. Oh, what, I think what? that one's breaking down a little bit. Like urban ecology is really taking off and mm. people people are, are becoming more aware of the importance of the little habitat patches, you know, in urban yeah. environments. Tell um, me more about that in Australia. That sounds fascinating because I'm, I'm really interested in urban ecologies as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, much of Australia's conservation management is still all about the national parks. Our national park system, you know, that's where the real biodiversity is and we keep it safe and that's great. Um, right. But there, there is a, a growing appreciation for what is in the urban landscapes. Right. Um, with, and I think through the pandemic as well, uh, having people sort of appreciate gardens and gardening and having more people like even in inner city neighborhoods have sort of community gardens and growing things. And there's a, there's a, real, uh, a real movement towards planting native species and things like that. Um, so like our council has a, a nursery where you can get plant native plants for really quite cheap. And so, you know, I've planted out like a huge area around our nature strip and things. Sorry, the, awesome. what do you call the part between the uh, footpath and the road? Uh, the sidewalk or no, no, the mediums. And is that what you're talking uh, about? Oh, I guess, I guess your footpaths are right at the side. Sorry, between the side. Uh, yeah. So here between the sidewalk and the road, there's often four or five meters of like grass. Oh yeah, that's right. Right, um, right. And it used to be, you know, that people would mow them to within an inch of their lives. Um, and now more and more you see these native gardens popping up in that. And that kind of habitat just for, you know, the invertebrates and the little animals and things. Uh, so we've got wild lizards in our garden and we live in a very, very urban place. Yeah. Um, so there is more appreciation of just how important that is in terms of connectivity and food resources for the birds, for the insects, for the lizards. Uh, but also in terms of the impact on the human mental health and how much pleasure people have been getting from having a bit of greenery around instead of just looking at brick walls. Yeah, I think urban ecologies have so much potential, especially when we as humans, because oftentimes we think we need to go to a national park or a wilderness area to get that connection to place and landscape. But really, I'm always just so blown away with urban ecologies and the rich, the species richness even um in urban landscapes too and how it's a good place for us to start massive. yeah and and it does make such a difference to brains i don't know if you've probably seen the study that was about um they had some patients in a hospital and some of them were facing out to a brick wall and some of them were facing out to trees and they, these were patients who had the sort of the morphine drip type thing and so oh. they could measure how much painkiller they gave themselves and how quickly they got discharged and things. And the people who were looking at a tree used less painkiller and got oh. out of there substantially earlier. It just, tree. and even like looking at a green wall, like with green paint on, <laughs> uh, does, us, yeah. does us more good than looking at a, a brick wall. We can make our environment better for ourselves and for all of the species around us. Coming back to the, um what we were talking about earlier, I want to, I, I didn't want to forget this question because um, I just remember how you said, I know this is kind of a big subject change, but you kind of, you talked about how um, invasion ecologists treat, because uh, this is also applicable in urban ecologies, because this is where a lot of people talk about this, but uh, how invasion ecologists treat invasion as a proper, as a process separate from ecology itself. And I've heard other Kind of critiques of invasion biology say it's like it's like the, a more it's it's a disassociate it's a science field that kind of dissociates from actual what's happening in ecology and the generalizations and it's also kind of connected to what we're talking about as like how humans are a part of the land right we are a part of the ecology so we can't treat these uh these subjects as separate processes from the ecology so could you speak to that a little bit yeah, um, 
I think, I mean, the first thing you're talking about with invasion biology fragmenting, one of the problems now is that academics are just publishing so many, so many papers every day. There's just, it's, it's like trying to watch all of YouTube. You just cannot keep up with literature. And so yeah, what absolutely. happens a little bit is the tropical ecologists only talk to and read other tropical ecology and the polar biologists are only looking at that and the invasion biologists are doing that thing and the marine biologists are doing the other. And this is really quite damaging because a lot of the same processes happen across different ecosystems. And so yeah. by falling apart, we're sort of missing the opportunity to share ideas between these different fields. Um, right. So that is a really major thing. But yeah, in, in terms of just getting, yeah, getting humans and their role in shaping ecosystems into focus and, and really understanding how quickly these ecosystems can adapt. And, and that's, that's not all bad news, right? We've got our native species moving and adapting in response to climate change. And that's exactly what we need them to do if, we, if we're gonna have those species into the future. So yeah. sort of giving them that space to change and, and maybe sort of trying to switch our ideas from how can we control what we have and keep it how it was and having this idea of being able to exert this complete, you know, you know we will make it like this, um, which is usually sort of beyond us, but to rather to try and manage this dynamic ecosystem and do the best for it as it goes through its changes. So, yeah. so one example of this, like we did a, a study recently, one of my honors students, and she was asking people, you know, how important do you think it is that species are migrating in response to climate change? And they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. We, we want species to move so that they can track their appropriate, you know, habitat right. or thermal range. Um, but then she also asked them, uh, what would you do if, and she asked people who live near the north of my state, what would you do if a species from Queensland came into New South Wales and you knew it didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't used to occur here? Would you, would you uh, get rid of it or, or would you let it grow? And almost everybody said, yeah, get rid of it. So we're both, we're both hoping that species move and then when they do move, we're killing them because that's not where they belong. And so if we don't reconcile our need to manage changing ecosystems. But that's really hard. Like, how do you legislate for, we're gonna let the species move around and the community composition change, but of course we don't want things to actually just get bulldozed and turned into parking lots. Like, yeah. how do you do that? I, I really don't know. Angela, this is such a big thing. This has been a big part of my work because a lot of these indigenous first foods of Western North America that I particularly work with are, their native ranges are changing, you know, and um, a lot of tribal groups are thinking about the bigger picture of like their traditional foods that their culture is inseparable from and that they have a mil millenniums of cultural connection to our, that are changing, the native ranges are changing, changing and I've been doing assisted migration experiments with these foods and it is a tense subject. I'll tell you what, it is very, risky to bring up some people are into it some people are really not and i wanted to ask you about your perspective on this because what you're talking about is basically assisted migration right because species migration well, no, actually, even just letting them migrate on their own yeah right is is controversial enough but yes if you totally. start bringing things in and actually actively modifying it's 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 like that uh, the philosophy problem with you know pull the lever to avoid killing the people you know <laughs> like, yeah because you know, there's a what's happening here, and I'm sure you have your own version of this happening in, in Australia, is there's a, a bureaucratic gridlock, basically, where conservationists and invasion biologists are like, oh my god, all these endemic native plants are going to go extinct because they can't move. And they're only growing on this one mountainside and this one mountain range on this part of California, but we can't, there's like this, uh, e this contradiction of like a ethos and philosophical moral system where like I can't move it but if I don't move it it'll go extinct and if we do move it what if it becomes the next like invasive species somewhere else so there's this gridlock where people are locked into their like bureaucratic rules and they just won't and they can't but then other citizen scientists like I don't consider myself a scientist but I'm a citizen and I'm like you know what I don't know like is there really one right way and like 
we don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm going to start doing the research and I'm going to start trying it because like we, I don't know how much time we have and I, I have a short life and I've been doing it with certain, you know, uh, indigenous food plants that actually have been so codependent on human disturbance through harvesting that disturbance is what they need to proliferate. You know, they need human disturbance. And that's primarily what I've been working with, but what's going on in Australia with that? Yeah, well, I mean, what, what you're getting at there is, is the issue of wanting to keep things how they were in the past while acknowledging that how they were in the past is not a system that we can keep going anymore. Yeah. Um, um, what people often do is we have some wonderful seed banks where, you know, they'll collect the seeds of those threatened species and freeze them down at minus 80 and go, well, at least we've, you know, we've got some of the seeds, we can, we can put them back. But, but it's not clear to me how you ever get out of that. Like if you let something go extinct in right. the wild, how are we, what is the plan going forward? And that comes back to not just looking to, well, it, you know, it has to be how it was in 1788, but going what is the best shape of things that we can have into the future? Yeah. And perhaps just changing to how do we keep the major, you know, how do we keep most, how we maximize the amount of our native biodiversity that is still here in a hundred years. Yeah. And that might be by moving some species around. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's certainly not by just trying to hold it still. And I think, I think that is going to be biting us harder and harder, but, in Australia, certainly in New South Wales, our conservation legislation is all about holding it in that pre-European condition. Right. Um, and I, I don't know how we can do that. And an, another problem we have here, I, I actually don't know how it is in the States, is um, conservation is done on a state-by-state -state basis. So we might have a species that's threatened in Queensland, the state to the north of me, that's not threatened in New South Wales. And so in New South Wales, people can be, you know, just killing this species. Right. Um, while in Queensland they're spending lots of money trying to conserve it and we sort of as the species are moving around and everything's shifting and changing we really need that a bigger view yeah that's that's also happening here state by state regulations and uh, different states have different state economies you know some you know places where a certain native plant that's protected in one place is actually a noxious weed to cattle in another place that is very cattle centric you know and so the, the the what i've found with my research on invasion biology here is a lot of what can designate even native plants as invasive is how they affect the preferences of uh, white cattle ranchers or big agricultural interests and i'm sure you understand too you go through this in australia that the amount oh, yes. of rev revenue produced for agricultural chemical companies through eradication of invasive species is massive, you know, and they're definitely in bed with the beast in that one. And it's a complicated issue because I'm thankful for conservation, you know, like we're all thankful yeah. for conservation. It's so much better than not having conservation areas and the, the, instead of the alternative, it all being completely privatized and destroyed. But then there's also a lot of room for growth, right? And it seems like you're, I, I appreciate what you're doing in that because it's just it's a, it's how people think about ourselves in relationship to it and just changing the way we think you know i hope we both outlive this right oh i hope so <laughs> yeah to to get people to understand our role in shaping the ecosystems around us yeah 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 well, i i would say uh, on on corporations some of the best conservation biology and particularly the sort of restoration and seed type technologies some of the best research in Australia is done by the mining companies because in wow. some states, when you dig a giant hole in the ground to get out the goodies, you have to promise to put 80% of the native species back. And so the mining companies in Western Australia have done some of the best seed restoration technologies uh, in really? the world. Yeah, really? wow. and that is a very uncomfortable fact for many ecologists. Yeah, that's an uncomfortable fact for me, but I mean, that's, I mean, <laughs> is that because there's like federal regulation pressure on them to clean up their yes. mess? Oh yeah, they're not, yes, you have to regulate yeah. to make good things like that happen. Yeah, I wish that was more the case here. I mean, that's good that that is because, you know, mining is disastrous, but one of the reasons that it is disastrous is because here in many cases, they're not taking responsibility for the cleanup afterwards, you know? So, I mean, that's, 
it's one of those contradictory paradoxes that we kind of just have to sit with and like hold the tension of those opposing those opposing viewpoints and realities you know absolutely uh, yeah. and in terms of respecting our indigenous history uh you yeah. may have may have missed this one but one of our big mining companies recently blew up a tens of thousand year old historic in, indigenous site um yeah so at least, at least it got a lot of public outrage that was rio tinto mining company right so oh, yeah i've been yeah. <laughs> That same mining company has been in a big battle with the San Carlos Apache tribe in Arizona. Last year at this time, I was walking with them to support them to resist this mining company that is um, in the process of create trying to take their land to create the world's new newest, biggest open, open pit copper mine on a site where they've been doing their ceremonies and where they've been gathering their traditional foods for thousands of years and it's that same company is on the shit list i tell you what like rio tinto oh, yeah. or yeah. they are rotten <laughs> i heard about that in australia and that that's tragic you know that, oh that was absolutely sickening um yeah. but yeah i i guess what it shows is the real importance of having you know good government regulation that's looking out for the interests of people not corporations i think yeah absolutely Absolutely. Well, yeah. I will definitely put links in the show notes of this podcast to your articles because it seems like most of them are pretty much just like not behind paywalls, which I also really appreciate. It's always good when they're not behind paywalls. And um, yeah, is there anything else you want to leave us with? Keep an open mind to, you know, the way the world around us is changing. Yeah. Well, thank you, awesome. Angela. You have a good day. You take care. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, y'all. Kelly here. You just listened to a conversation between Gabe Crawford and Angela Moles. Really hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. You can support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Salt. It's always linked in the show notes of every episode. Patreon is one of the best ways to support the ongoing work of this project in an ongoing way. The theme music for this episode is Sweat and Splinters by Mother Marrow. This episode was hosted by Gabe Crawford and produced by me, Kelly Moody. Please do give us a review on iTunes or anywhere you listen to this podcast to help us be seen. And um, really enjoy your listenership. And until next time, y'all. Every piece of wood I bring carries a story. Same to you, all of